scripture text is in the Gospel of Mark. We're continuing our studies in chapter 3, and we'll finish up that chapter looking at verses 20 through 35. The Lord has um, been ministering throughout Galilee. <clears throat> we had a mention of his uh, disciples whom he had chosen, and now we read in verse 20, and he came home. And the crowd gathered again to such an extent that they could not even eat a meal. When his own people heard this, they went out to take custody of him, for they were saying, he has lost his senses. The scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed by Beelzebul, and he casts out the demons by the ruler of the demons. And he called them to himself and began speaking to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but he is finished. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sins shall be forgiven, the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin because they were saying, he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers arrived, and standing outside, they sent word to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. Answering them, he said, Who are my mother and my brothers? Looking about at those who were sitting around him, he said, Behold my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's pray. In his book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis considers the question who was Jesus, and gave only three options as answers. He was either a lunatic, or a Lucifer, or the Lord. You can shut him up for a fool, he wrote. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. That was insightful of Lewis, but it did not originate with him. We find those same options in our passage this morning in Mark chapter 3. The demons had confessed him to be the Son of God. His family thought he was losing his mind, while his enemies accused him of being in league with Beelzebub. It happened when he was ministering to crowds in Galilee, healing the sick, expelling demons. He returned home to Capernaum and entered the house to gain some rest and refreshment. But he and his disciples were hardly there before the crowds again gathered and, and were asking for more from him. To such an extent, Mark says, that they could not even eat a meal. It was at this time, and in part for this reason, that his own people, which means his family, showed up and were saying, he has lost his senses. So they had come to take him home. His mother Mary was probably concerned that he was working too hard, that he had over exerted himself, that he needed some rest. But his brothers evidently thought that he was unstable. 
We know from John chapter 7 and verse 5 that they didn't believe in him. In fact, they were hostile to him. And now they thought he was delusional. He was experiencing the Jerusalem syndrome or he had a Messiah complex, some psychotic episode. They couldn't believe that he was the Christ, but since he was believing it, and since he was behaving as though he were, they concluded that he must be mad. Now that's the response of the world. It's what you're believing your unbelieving friends or unbelieving family will think of you when you practice your faith and when you show a firm commitment to Christ. The Roman governor Festus accused Paul of that very thing when he was recounting to him and to the others his conversion on the Damascus Road. Festus finally had enough. He said in a loud voice, he shouted, Paul, you are out of your mind. Well, Paul explains that response in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 14, or rather chapter 2 and verse 14, a natural man, an unbelieving man, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. They hear the truth, and in their mind it's foolishness. And so they will think that we are at best odd, or unbalanced, or even mad. Jesus' brothers and sisters thought that he had lost it, so they came for him. They weren't the only ones. Some scribes had also arrived at the house. They had a different explanation for Jesus. He presented a problem for them. They knew what he had done was supernatural. He'd done miracles. They'd seen it. He'd healed people. He cast out demons. Now that can't be explained by madness. So they concluded it was a conspiracy. Jesus had made a pact with the devil. He is possessed by Beelzebul and he casts out the demons by the ruler of the demons. He was a devil practicing black magic. So this is how they approach things. Madness is a condition, and it's disqualifying. Satanism is something else. It's an act, and it's evil. He is a deceiver, they were saying. Though it seems saying it not directly to him, saying it just out of earshot. Mark indicates that by saying that he called them to himself. He called them over, which indicates something more of the supernatural. They're speaking among themselves quietly, but he knows what they're saying, what they're speaking, just as he knew what they were thinking to themselves. They then exposed the falseness of their accusation with some simple logic. He asked, how can Satan cast out Satan? Does that really make sense? He was asking because if he were exercising demons by the power of the devil, then Satan would be fighting against himself and dooming his own kingdom. If a kingdom is divided against itself, he said, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not stand. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but he is finished. Now, Satan is, is too shrewd for such a, a careless, self-defeating strategy. So that charge is illogical on the face of it. And that answered the second charge that they had made, that his ministry was empowered by Satan. And now, in verse 27, he answers the first charge, that he was possessed by Satan. If that were so, then Satan would be stronger than Christ. And yet, all his deeds demonstrated that he was overpowering Satan. He was destroying him. He makes the point with a parable, verse 27, 
But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house. Obviously a man who enters a strong man's house and binds him, ties him up, and uh, takes his treasure is stronger than the strong man. And that's what Jesus did. He, in effect, entered Satan's house. He entered his domain when he defeated the demons by delivering those that they had taken captive. He plundered Satan. He set the prisoner free. So his exorcisms cannot be uh, attributed to the devil. It can only be attributed to the power of God. It can only be attributed to that power which is far greater than Satan's. So on the face of it, on the basis of the evidence of what has taken place, he proves that it's all. His power is the power of God. In Luke's account, he uses an expression that we see in the Old Testament. He calls it not the power of God, but the finger of God, which is the expression that the magicians used in Egypt when they described the miracles that Moses did. And uh, of the three explanations given here of who Jesus was, either mad or bad or God, only one, that third explanation, makes sense logically and from the evidence. Now, having said that, there is a fourth explanation for Jesus and all that he did. Uh, Bart Ehrman, who is a former evangelical but now an um, atheist who is a New Testament professor as well, gave a, th a what we call a fourth explanation and, and suggested that maybe all of this is simply a legend. It never happened. All of this are, that we read about are just tall tales. He's not the only one that's made that, uh, that statement. Christopher Hitchens, uh, the late atheist who wrote a book, God is Not Great, makes the same point. In fact, he makes a personal attack on C.S. Lewis and his three options. And, and, and they make the point, um, I don't have to believe any of these things are true. I don't have to believe that Jesus even existed. And so we can dismiss all of that as just, it didn't happen. Well, that may be the case that one can do that, but that's done in the face of all of the facts that we do have. And as, as has been said, facts are stubborn things. And they show what a really, I think, a counsel of despair that fourth option is. Saying it never happened can't explain everything that has happened. Doesn't explain the existence of the church doesn't explain all the New Testament documents that we have and the, the many ancient documents that we have that support all of this that we read. doesn't explain the very early and extensive testimony of the church and even of the pagans to the truth of these things. By uh, generation after Christ was crucified, the church existed. It was all over the known world. Even uh, within 30 years of our Lord's death, it's, it's a vibrant church in the city of Rome itself. How do you explain that? It's not based upon myth or legend. It can only be based upon the things that we see here, that we read here. But again, a natural man, as Paul said, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he adds, he cannot understand them. Underline that. Cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. And so when scripture and evidence shut an unbeliever up to the conclusion that Jesus is God, he or she rebels against that and finds solace in anything that will give them another explanation, any option, even when it's absurd. Look, even the demons knew better. They confessed that Jesus is the Son of God. Even the magicians could see that Moses' deeds were the finger of God. Pharaoh refused to listen. He doubled down. He strengthened his unbelief, which was what these scribes and Pharisees did. 
They refused to see God's power in Christ's miracles. And so their end would be the same as Pharaoh's. Their hearts would be hardened in unbelief. A warning that goes for anyone who dismisses Christ as false, whether dismissing him as mad or as a myth or a liar. But Jesus had a special warning for these scribes, and it was chilling. He says in verses 28 and 29, Truly I say to you, all sins shall be forgiven, the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness and is guilty of an eternal sin. Never has forgiveness. It's an eternal sin. Now that's final, and that is without recovery. How are we to understand that? What, what is this unpardonable sin? It's an important question because it has troubled many people, people weighed down with guilt, people with a sensitive conscience. It's not uncommon for ministers to counsel people who are concerned about this because of something they did that uh, continues to trouble them, a fear that, that what they have done is so bad it can't be forgiven and so they, they must have committed this unpardonable sin. Well, probably the best place to begin answering this question, explaining what it is, is to explain what it is not. It's not moral failure, like committing adultery or fornication. It's not even murder. As bad as all of that is, that wasn't the problem of the Pharisees. They, they were not immoral men. They were upright, law-abiding men. And outwardly, they were models of uh, mor morality. But, but even people who have committed those sins have been forgiven when they repented. David was guilty of adultery and murder. He was forgiven. Peter denied the Lord three times. And not only that, but he added curses to his denial as well. And yet... He was forgiven. And Scripture, of course, is full of verses declaring God's readiness to forgive sin, to remove sin, our sins, as far as the east is from the west, and to cast them all into the depths of the sea. Still, there is this sin, and there were men who committed it and who became forever unforgivable. Who are they? Who does that? And what did they do? They were knowledgeable men, scribes and Pharisees. They were the lawyers. They were the great teachers of the law. They knew the Word of God. They knew much. They are the ones that committed a very specific sin. And I, I, I say that it's a specific sin. This isn't a, some general category of sin. It's a particular sin. It's a unique sin. They committed blasphemy, but it's not just blasphemy. They blasphemed Jesus, and yet he said that was forgivable. What isn't forgivable is blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Now, why is that? The Spirit's not greater than the Son. Both are equal in deity. The difference is due to the historical situation. Jesus was in his humanity. Deity was veiled. It was hidden in his human nature. In, in both cases, it was a rejection of the truth. But with Christ, the truth of his person, of his glory was veiled in his flesh. So while they were culpable of sin, they were still pardonable. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13, Paul recounts his sin against Christ and against the church, but he does say that he did it in ignorance. And that uh, alleviated him of some guilt. 
What was unpardonable about blaspheming the Holy Spirit is there was nothing veiled about it. There was nothing obscure about his work. The, the miracle that he had performed, the miracles that he had done were clearly the work of God. And, and all of this was the fulfillment of prophecy. In Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 9, the prophet speaks of the servant. He speaks of the Messiah. He describes him and his work. He says that, that, that God's Spirit would be upon him and he would do these miracles. Well, they knew the prophecies. They knew about the Spirit and then they witnessed these miracles of the Spirit, and they didn't deny the miracles. They witnessed the fulfillment of prophecy. Still, they rejected all of it, not out of ignorance, but in spite of the obvious evidence. Their sin was done, as the Dutch theologian G.C. Burkhauer said, out of a conscious disputing of the indisputable. And they added to their guilt by attributing the Spirit's work to Satan. They really said, the Spirit in him doing this is Satan. And they persisted in that. Mark wrote in verse 30, they were saying, he has an unclean spirit. We're saying, that expression, that verb is uh, imp the imperfect tense. And I mention that because it's not simply a past tense, but it speaks of a pattern in the past. It speaks of that which is repeated in the past. So this is a repetition of what they did. So they, they, they didn't simply say this once. They said it numerous times. They persisted in this blasphemy. In fact, they were propagandizing with this blasphemy. So it indicates a fixed attitude. They were hardened against the truth and hardened in the lie. And they were unwilling to repent. This was a, a serious and defining moment. It was the final break between Jesus and the religious authorities. The division between him and these leaders, these religious leaders, from this point on is irreconcilable. From now on, Jesus will begin teaching in parables, concealing the truth from the, the general audience while revealing it very specifically or in a, in a limited circle to his disciples. We see that in the next chapter, in chapter 4, he begins speaking in parables to them. So this was a serious moment. This was a dividing moment in the Lord's ministry to the nation, and, and which had in, included those, uh, those leaders. So the question we would ask is, does this happen today? And that's what people worry about. But it seems from the context and the contrast that Jesus makes between himself and the Spirit that this was a unique sin for that time alone. It, it was a sin that occurred and could only occur during the Lord's incarnation when the work of the Holy Spirit was attributed to Satan. It's worth noting, I think, that while the unpardonable sin, as we call it, is mentioned in Matthew Mark and Luke. It's not mentioned in the Gospel of John, and none of the apostles mention it in the rest of the New Testament. Really, the, the very fact that people are concerned about having committed this sin, the fact that it would worry them is in itself evidence that they have not committed it. Pharisees had no concern about this. They had committed it, but they weren't worried about that. that. They responded to this by hardening their hearts all the more rather than repenting. Even so, people do sin against the Holy Spirit. Christians can grieve the Spirit. Christians can quench the Spirit. This, that is not this sin. But Paul does warn against that, and we should be warned against doing that. And people do even worse. They reject 
the promptings of the Holy Spirit when they hear about forgiveness. The Lord speaks through His Word. The Spirit of God speaks in the Word of God, whether it's what we, what we read or what we hear. The Spirit is in that. And He's heard in that. And people can reject that and, and uh, harden themselves against that. But He speaks through His Word. The British poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge wrote uh, of that in some personal letters to a friend that were later compiled in a book. In fact, I have the book. It's titled Confessions of an Inquiring Spirit. And in one of the letters he wrote, The Bible Finds Me. I found that interesting because I've read that kind of statement by others as well. The Bible finds me. It's like it's a living thing. It's unique, and that's the point that Coleridge was making. It's unique. Of all the books, of all the letters, of all the things he had read, this book finds me. It spoke to his soul. It spoke to the very depths of his being and his condition as nothing else did, and that proved itself as being the Word of God. Scripture brings what he called, what Coleridge called, irresistible evidence that it proceeded from the Holy Spirit. Or put another way, the Bible is self-authenticating. It proves itself. We don't need to find all kinds of evidences for it. If one simply reads it, the proof of it shines out. And one way it shines out is it convicts us and brings us under a sense of our need and our guilt. It proves itself. But Men can resist that. They resist the evidence when it finds them in their sin and their unbelief because that's where we don't want to be found. They, they are not comfortable with that. They reject the pleadings of the Spirit with the result that their hearts are hardened. Now that is not this sin, but that happens today. And it is as deadly as the unpardonable sin of Jesus' day. When men become scoffers of truth, they put themselves beyond repentance, just as Pharaoh did when he snubbed the finger of God, and the Pharisees did when they, marked, when they mocked the work of the Spirit. So the warning from this is the warning that the author of Hebrews would later give, which is actually a warning that's taken from the Psalms by David. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7, today if you hear His voice, or we could say today if you, if you read His words, do not harden your hearts. It's a dangerous thing. Respond to the Word of God. Now in verse 31, it's back to the family and their concern that Jesus was delusional. They stood outside the house because the crowd was uh, too large to enter, so they called to him. They, they wanted him to come to them. They wanted to take him home. For centuries, that's how people cared for the insane. There, there were no asylums. So families kept a, a son or an aunt at home and kept them under supervision and would hide them in the attic when company came. So this is what they're proposing to do. So someone brought word to the Lord, brought a message that his mother and brothers and probably his sisters were all outside looking for him and he knew what was going on just as he knew what the scribes and the Pharisees were up to. And the Lord used the interruption of his ministry to good advantage. Verse 33, answering them, he said, Who are my mother and my brothers? Looking about at those who were sitting around him, he said, Behold my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Those are not the words of a madman. They are not the words of a bad man. They are the words of a wise man. They gave a, per a 
piercing rebuke to his family as well as to his foes. His true family and true friends and followers are those who do the will of God. That's true kinship with Christ and with one another. The truest family relationship is spiritual, not physical. John would later write in John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. That's what Jesus would tell the, the Pharisee and the great teacher of Israel, Nicodemus, in John chapter 3. You must be born again. Otherwise a person is hopelessly in the dark. He or she has no understanding of these things. No more understanding than the scribes of the Pharisees did or the Lord's brothers did. He or she may not think Christ is mad or demonic he may honor him, actually, as a great human teacher. And that, that seems less offensive, and I would certainly say it is. It certainly seems less hostile to praise him as a great moral leader, a great example. Certainly more sympathetic than to say he's a madman or he's a, a, a devil. But it's just as far away from the truth. In order to know the truth, to know Christ, there must be a complete spiritual change. I don't mean turning over a new leaf. I mean becoming a new person. That person needs new birth. Every sinner in this world needs new birth, needs regeneration. That's the sovereign work of the Spirit. That's what He does for the unbelieving who are the spiritually dead. That's how John, that's how Paul describes us, as you all know, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. You were dead. They're the walking dead. And will be and continue to be and, and consider everything that we read in this book to be foolishness until the Spirit of God, by the will of God, comes upon them and quickens them and changes them. And those who are regenerated not only understand and believe they enter into the greatest privilege a person can have. They're made members of God's family, which is eternal. We shouldn't miss the, the moment of this statement. We shouldn't miss when it was that Jesus looked about at this group and looked about at his disciples and called them family. It's before Pentecost. It was early in the disciples' association with Jesus when, when they were immature and they were men of little faith. In fact, he would tell them that. And they would stumble along the way and they would disappoint the Lord. And in his human nature, he expresses frustration with them. Have I been with you so long and you still do not understand? They'll sin even grievously at the end of it. Peter, as we've said, denied him three times and denied him with curses. When our Lord was taken in the garden and then Peter comes to the garden of the high priest or the courtyard and is exposed. That didn't take the Lord by surprise. The Lord knew all of that long before it happened, before He ever chose these men. He knew their failures and He knew... They're, they're the failures of the future as well as he knew their failures in the past. Still he chose them and he called them and he was happy as he looked around at them there in that house and called them his family. And that applies to us. Regardless of our maturity in the faith, regardless of our achievements or our lack of achievements, we are equally important to the Lord. No one person is more important to him than another. The least of us is as important to him, which is infinitely important, as the greatest of us. He loves us all alike equally and infinitely. 
He makes that clear in, in the word that he uses here, whoever. Whoever does the will of God. Whoever. He is my brother and sister and mother. Regardless of all the differences that we have. And so the church is made up of all kinds of, of people. Male and female. Jew and Gentile. Rich and poor. Simple and sophisticated. Whoever. Whoever believes is his friend and his family. Now that's the grace of God. And it governs our lives from beginning to end. From one end of eternity to the other, if we can speak of eternity like that. It, it is eternal. Grace is always with us because he's always with us. And he sustains us along the way to, to teach us and to guide us, to pick us up along the way when we stumble and set us back on our feet and back on the path. And we're always stumbling and we're always needing to be picked up and he's always there with us to do that. But because we are his family, we are united and we are in need of each other. The world is as hostile now as it was then and so it will call us mad or it will call us fools. It may even try to destroy us as it did Jesus. In fact, he warned his disciples of that right at the end in that upper room discourse in John 15 and verse 20. He said that if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. To be fore, forewarned is to be forearmed and he was arming them with that. When that happens, and it will happen, if you're living an earnest life, if you're living for the Lord and the world sees that, you're going to experience this kind of hostility. And when that happens, we'll need each other. We'll need to have the mutual support of one another. That's apostolic. Paul wrote of that in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2. He gave a simple word of instruction. Bear one another's burdens. It's rather general, but it's specific as well. You're going to need one another. Bear them up in their weaknesses. Bear them up each other up in, in your persecution. That's what the author of Hebrews is saying. And that, speaking of the race that we're running, he says in Hebrews 12, verse 12, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble. Well, they're weak and feeble for lots of reasons. But one reason, particularly in regard to that book of Hebrews, is they were worn out and worn down from the opposition that they were experiencing. And so will we be for living kind of life that the Lord is speaking of here. We, we are a family, as the Lord said. We are the truest family there is, with more in common with each other than we have with those who are our natural family, if that's the only thing in common we have with them. So we must be involved with each other. We must be involved with the church, not in a, a casual way, but involved in its ministry, involved with the lives of each other. It is required of us, and, and not only that, it should be our desire to be with one another, to be a help to one another. But even when we fail to do that, and the fact is we do fail to do that, the Lord never fails. He claims every believer as his family, individually and personally, his brother or sister. He values each of us highly. There, there is nothing mad or bad or demonic or deceiving about that. There is, is nothing in the Lord's life, nothing revealed in Scripture that could lead anyone to conclude such things about Him. What is revealed here about Him is he is the all-powerful, the all-wise, eternal Son of God. He is very God of very God. He was a great human teacher. Even his enemies had to confess that. The, the Sanhedrin sent the temple police out to arrest him, and they came back empty-handed, and they said, where is he? And they said, never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. His teaching repelled them from doing anything harmful. No, he's a great human teacher, that's true, but he's far more than that. He's infinitely more than that. When Doubting Thomas met him 
after the resurrection and saw the wounds in his hand and side, he was compelled to confess after stating such doubts and, and such firm resolve not to believe in him unless he saw it all. When he did, he said, my Lord and my God. And that's not just John's theme and profession. It's throughout the four Gospels and all of the Word of God. That's what the evidence shows. Can you confess that? This is the testimony of the Gospels. This is the testimony of the Apostles. It's the testimony of the church down through the centuries. He is God who sets the prisoner free and invites all to come to Him. He receives all who do. He blesses them with eternal life, which is the best life. He brings them into His family forever. If you've not believed in Him, if you've not put your faith in Him, I invite you to do that. We invite you to do that. The Lord Jesus Christ stretches out His arms all day long and invites you to come to Him. May God help you to do that. And you who have, rejoice in who He is and knowing that you are part of His family. May we all live as that way, in that way. Let's pray. Father, we do thank You for Your truth and exposing the errors of men, whether they think He was mad or a devil. Some would say just a great teacher. We know who He is. The clear testimony of your word is that he is your son and our savior. And we give you praise and thanks for sending him into this world. May we honor him, may we live for him, and be a blessing to one another, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.